uh, what Michelle was talking about is uh, Bobby and I were on the same show on Five Card Stud. And uh, it started out, I had a new pair of boots I wore down there to Durango. The company was already down in Mexico and Bobby and I went down later. <coughs> and I had my new boots on the way and they drove us out to the set and uh, to uh, let us, uh, Mr. Hathaway see us. And, uh, and I had my new boots on, and Bobby worked for Henry before, he just kept his mouth shut. And uh, Henry looked at us, didn't, he didn't say hello, he didn't say nothing. He says, he says are new, those are new boots, Collins. I said, uh, yes sir, You'll get some cow shit on them, will you make them look like they're... <laughs> That's all he said to us. I turned, I turned back, and so Bobby and I left. And now, um, we've got a scene to do about three days. With it. You guys have seen that scene where I killed him? Yeah, yeah. And so we got to rehearse that thing. And uh, now we're both, I mean, scared to death old Henry. He just says, you know, he, if he starts picking on you, you're dead meat. You know, you start stumbling your words and stuttering and all that, you he'll look off. So we want to rehearse that scene and get it just absolutely perfect. So we go to Bobby's room and uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll go in the, I'll go on this side of the room, you on this side, and I'll start walking like I'm going to walk in that scene. Okay. So I get back there, and I start walking slowly towards him. I forgot what the dialogue was. All right, you mean, man. And he said something. We look at each other and just <laughs> start giggling. <laughs> I said, no, Bobby, you can't giggle. Okay, I start again. And I'm sure you guys have been in a situation like that yourself, you know, where you so we started again, we tried to get it going. And I started walking across and said, all right, you son. <laughs> and we tried and tried and tried. I walked out of the room, I said, well, I'll, I'll open the door, come in, maybe that'll. And I tried that and tried that. And we couldn't get it done. We just, we tried for a couple of hours. It got to the point we're just exhausted. Just, you know, we almost hated each other by that time. And, um, to finish the little story, the next day we go out, we're going to shoot the thing. And you don't want, Henry doesn't have to say, let's do that again because he, he really get mean. So we set up for the scene and I've got my group and on action, I'm going to walk over and I'm, we're going to have a thing. I'm going to kill Bobby. And I walk across the street and I did something wrong. And I went, oh my God. And I just turned and turned and walked back. And Henry, you're back there with a cigar looking at you. What the hell happened? You know, I said, no, I'm ready, Henry. I'm, yeah, I'm all set. And he says, oh, I thought, he, I thought the world's going to end for me right there. He says, well, all right, we'll try it again. Well, thank God you did. We did it. Went off fine. And you guys have seen what, what it looked like. So we little girl, I would go and watch my dad, literally on the cutting room floor, there'd be mounds of film, and I would watch it with his white gloves as he would sit there and do the editing with his pen, with his wax pencil, and I'd be fascinated watching him. And I'd, I think what they do now is so totally different. I, think, I wonder if my dad would ever have adapted to be able to do what they do now, but as a little girl, I thought, that's my hero, that's my dad, because of what he could do, and he never talked, he was very quiet, it was just always the sound of the film going through, and he, he, he was truly my hero of what he could do, but he was very quiet about what he did until I had my two sons. And then every Sunday, we'd go over there for dinner, and every Sunday, he would tell my sons another story about what had happened during the week. Now, why he never felt like he wanted to share them with me, but you know, as I say, he never shared them with my mother. My mother and I would be in doing dishes, and he had Chad and Brett, and he shared them with them. He wanted my son to go into the business with him, and my son were up. He was right there with them and they took over the Western Warehouse and was going to be there, but 
when Michael passed away, the light went out of my dad's life. It truly went out of his life, and I could see it. And uh, my dad didn't last much longer after Michael died. And, uh, you know, Michael was up filming what they thought was going to be the show that my son was going to go in to be in the photography end of it. Or the, and uh, it, it just, it really, you know, was the end. And it's, he's, you know, as Kent said, we'd be having dinner and all of a sudden we'd get the phone call. Of course, they didn't do computers. And that would be it. He'd get up and go. And if you wanted to take my, you know, chat with it, they'd get up in the middle of dinner and go if there was a problem. And they'd head into wherever they were, you know, doing the show from. And no matter how much work it took, how many hours, my dad was always on, you know, was up by 6 a.m. and hitting that road. You know, I, I wonder, how did he do it? Because he worked until he, you know, was 80. And I think, how did he work that long? You know, I, I don't, and they weren't easy hours. It wasn't easy work. They had the three-wheelers that, you know, after he retired, he, my sons took over the three-wheelers that they, I think, terrorized MGM with those three wheelers. <laughs> uh, you know, it, was a, I, I, it wasn't an easy life, but it was a life that I am so proud of, so proud to have been a part of, so proud to know that he put it together. He took the pieces of this puzzle, uh, the music and the actor and the sound, and if it, he made the whole. He made, and I would, if I was happy to be over at their house, we'd be watching something. Of course, he would always tell me about two minutes before something was going to happen. And so you always knew what it was going to be, so it wasn't a lot of fun to watch it. <laughs> you know, he would tell me this, and it always, he was always dead on. He always knew exactly when the thing was going to be. And just, I, just now, if I see my dad's name, if you come across a bonanza or a little house, and they're still showing. I live in Reno, and you still, you know, close to the high chaparral area. But you still see his name, and you hear the music. And I swear that music, your heart is in your throat when you hear any of the music. And then I see my dad's name at the end. I still got his Emmy. When he got his first Emmy for the bonanza, and he had it. Now, my dad liked to clean things. <laughs> and so we we'd go over there every Sunday for dinner. And my, my dad was out in the garage and he had a bucket. And he filled it with whatever he wanted to fill it with to clean things. This was particularly Sunday. He had gasoline in there. He had ammonia. No telling what was in the bucket. There was a Zemi in the bucket that he was scrubbing with a brush. <laughs> And uh, so I went, I'm going, okay, now my husband could get away with a lot more with my dad than I could have ever gotten away. So he went out there, and this poor Emmy, all the gold was gone. <laughs> he stripped that tire thing, and he was really happy with himself that he did. He was very pleased with himself, as only you could remember my dad being pleased with himself. He liked it better that way, he said. Okay. So when he died, my older son got that particular Emmy. That we got another Emmy because when the earthquake hit, it broke off the the one point. So we got another Emmy. So my younger son has that one. My husband today bought, got me a brand new one for Christmas in one year. So I've got a brand new one sitting in my living room. And people today that don't know me, they walk in the house, that's the first thing they see. And they say, if that isn't real, isn't it? And yes, that is real. Can I touch it? Well, yeah, you can touch it. It will break. I mean, but I still see that in me. And I still go over and touch it. And I, and I talk to them. And I say, you did it. You did it, and you did it right. You put those pieces together, and you made those shows work so beautifully. And you know, without you, maybe it wouldn't have ever worked. That it wouldn't and I I don't think he's done it today. I don't know how he would have worked with computers. You know, he potatoes and vegetables if you wanted to 
baked potato. You had to tell the waitress you wanted a baked potato. And they came around with all these carts and they cut the fiber in just the way you wanted it. And she put down the potato, baked potato in front of Marvin. And she says, there's a stick there, you could read it. And he said, so and so, for this price, you could read it. <laughs> so she picked up the stick and she says, it says, I've roasted and cooked, rubbed and scrubbed, and you could eat all of me. Oh. Marvin says, for crying out loud, I'll be talking about you and a potato. <laughs> ends this uh, q and A. I I do want to say one thing. If you notice on your program, we're having a long lunch, and I think that'll give you the time to go next door and uh, to where there will be signing pictures, and I'll be signing my book, so if you want to, uh, we'll, we'll work it out. We try to schedule everything time-wise. It sometimes goes over, sometimes doesn't, so. Well, I put this one, and I think Susan's going to take over the next one. Yes, I Only am. trouble is, I got to get out, and she has to get out. I know. So I'm going to do out. this. Yes, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll go down the ramp. Well, here. these scooters are fun, but they're uh, <laughs> yeah. a pain in the tail. Literally. Okay, I'll leave that there. I want to make sure that. And I'm not getting there. I'm I'm not getting out. I'm sitting right here. Okay. Well, what do you want for lunch? I just had breakfast. Oh, but you're going to stay here. You might as well have lunch. Okay.